This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Malabranche. In the beginning, Gary Gygax and David Arneson created Dungeons & Dragons rules for fantastic medieval war games campaigns playable with paper and pencil and miniature figures. And they saw that it was good. The beginning here refers to 1974. Sometime later, evil came to the world of Dungeons & Dragons. The devil arrived. Or rather, devils arrived. And then, sometime later still, evil really came to D&D and the devils disappeared. And even later, they returned, but they were very different. And that all makes for a very interesting story because the devil, the one with a capital D from the Semitic and Abrahamic religions, was not there in the beginning, arrived on the scene sometime later, and then got transformed by popular culture. And the story of the actual devil feeds into the story of the D&D &D devil in several ways beyond mere inspiration. And the Malabranche is the perfect example of how the stories tie together. Let's start with the story of the devil in D&D. &D. The devil first appeared in 1977 in the Advanced Dungeons & Dragons 1st Edition Monster Manual. Or rather, the devils did. Because there were several, a sort of hierarchy. You had the Barbed Devil, the Bone Devil, the Arrhenias, the Horned Devil, the Ice Devil, the Lemur, and the Pit Fiend. You also had four Arch Devils, Asmodeus, Baalzebul, Despater, and Gurion. I should also note, because it is the word of the week and we are coming back to it, that the Horned Devil had an alias, a throwaway parenthetical name. He was the Horned Devil, a.k.a. Malabranche. A weird little detail, but a very important one. Devils proved to be very popular in D&D, &D, and that's not surprising really. In a supernatural world where good and evil were constantly at war, devils make an excellent final boss of sorts. And hell, or rather the nine hells, were a compelling place. A lawful evil plane filled with aristocratic fiends doing every lawful thing they could to get ahead. A series of articles in Dragon Magazine greatly expanded the canon of the Nine Hells and the roster of devils, adding the Abishai, Bearded Devils, and Spined Devils, and a huge pile of named archdevils like Mephistopheles, Nurgle, Bensosia, and over two dozen others. People loved the devils in D&D. &D. So... When Advanced Dungeons & Dragons 2nd Edition was released starting in 1989, everyone was absolutely delighted to see that the Monsters Compendium included stats for all of their favorite devils like the... Uh, hang on, let me check. Uh, there's, um... Uh... Oh, wait. Where are all the devils? There weren't any. Not a one. They were gone. And when they finally reappeared two years later, first in a supplemental monstrous compendium, and then in the Planescape campaign setting, they weren't devils at all. They were the Beatizu. From the nine layers of Beator, you had the Abishai, Amnizu, the Barbazu, the Kornugon, Hamatula, Azalath, and the Spanagon. And if you looked really closely, you'd see that they really were still the devils. The Bone Devil had become the Ozolith, and the Spinagon was definitely the Spined Devil. What the hell happened? Well, what happened was that D&D got accused of being involved with real devils, with THE Devil. In 1982, a woman named Patricia Pulling founded an organization called Bothered About Dungeons and Dragons, or BAD. See, Pulling's son had taken his own life, and, for various reasons, she blamed D&D. &D. 
She even filed a wrongful death lawsuit against several people and ultimately Tactical Studies Rules, or TSR, the original publishers of D&D. Later on, a devout Christian author named William Schnobelin wrote an article in which he explained that he was a reformed gamer as well as a reformed satanic priest and advised Christians to eschew Dungeons and Dragons as a feeding program for occultism and witchcraft. He wrote several more articles, which were published by famous religious tract publisher Jack Chick, who went on to publish a cartoon tract condemning D&D, known as Dark Dungeons. There were other incidents as well. The most famous involved a troubled 16-year-old named James Dallas Egbert III. Egbert attempted suicide, faked his own death, and disappeared for a month. He later went on to successfully take his own life a year after the incident. His depression and suicide were blamed on his involvement with Dungeons & Dragons. The entire incident was fictionalized by journalist Rona Jaffe, who published a book called Mazes and Monsters in 1981. This book supposedly exposed the dangerous psychological impact that Dungeons and Dragons had on its players. And in 1982, Tom Hanks starred in the movie version of the same book. Because no one really understood D&D at the time, these sensational accounts and dire warnings resonated with parents especially parents with strong religious beliefs. Dungeons & Dragons suffered a tremendous backlash, especially with the game growing in popularity. In the end, the game designers and developers at TSR scrubbed the new second edition clean of most direct references to demons and devils. And when they did finally bring demons and devils back, they created new races, the Beatazu and the Tanari, who were locked in endless war with each other instead of warring with the forces of good in the heavens. Uh, sorry, in Celestia. Eventually, though, things calmed down and people found other things to be panicked about. Kurt Cobain happened. Video games happened. And so the media had new scapegoats to blame tragedies on. And when the moral panic finally subsided, well... There was an issue. They had two sets of devils. Bearded devils, barbed devils, spine devils on the one side, and Barbazoo, Cornigons, and Spinagons on the other. And was Hell Hell? Or was it Beator? In the end, the answer was both. Remember how the horned devil had a little nickname? It was a Melabronche? Well... Now they could do the same with every devil. Spined devil, open parenthesis, spinagon, close parenthesis. Done and done. And they called it the Nine Hells of Beator. The implication was that Beator, Beatazu, Spinagon, Cornagon, and so on? Those were the proper names. That's what the fiends called themselves. Hell, bearded devil, spined devil, bone devil... That's what stupid mortals called them. But here's an interesting question. D&D &D takes most of its inspiration from real-world mythologies, religions, fairy tales, and pop culture, right? So where did the idea that there were nine hells and hierarchies of devils come from? When you go back to scripture, isn't there just one devil? The devil? Satan? Well, that's complicated. See, religious scholars have been arguing forever about where the devil actually came from. The trouble is, the Bible actually doesn't say much about the Big D. If you ask most people, they will say that the devil was once an angel who challenged God's authority, failed, and was cast down into hell. They also might say he was the serpent who corrupted Adam and Eve. They also might say he was also Lucifer, the angel that served as the prosecutor of mankind. And they might say he's the Antichrist and his number is 666. But most of that stuff isn't actually in the Bible. What's in the Bible is actually pretty sparse, and it's hard to get a straight answer because even the most knowledgeable scholars have different answers. 
Most of what we know about the devil today, and most of what found its way into D&D, grew up from pop culture. Just like the D&D devils expanded and gained popularity through supplements, so too did the historical devil. For example, our understanding of devil as a fallen angel and traitor is mostly thanks to John Milton and his poems Paradise Lost and Paradise Regained, which tell the story of Satan's rebellion against God. And our understanding of the nine circles of hell ruled by specific fiends? That's all thanks to Durante dei Alighieri, who you probably know as Dante. Dante was a Florentine poet, and his most famous work was a three-part epic superpoem called The Divine Comedy. The first part, Inferno, described his journey through hell with his favorite poet and best buddy, Virgil. Virgil was a real historical poet, and Dante was a big fan. It's the equivalent of me writing a story where I have endless adventures with my bestest buddy, Gary Gygax, in the afterlife. It was basically one long bit of self-insert fan fiction. In fact, it was even more fan fiction than most people realize. See, Dante was very active in the chaotic political mess that was 13th century Florence, and he hated a lot of people. So, while he and his friend Virgil wandered through hell, they kept meeting people being punished in really terrible ways like being buried up to their faces in human feces, or being stung by wasps, or being blown around endlessly in a tornado made of lust. I'm not kidding. Some of the people were historical figures, but lots of the people were people Dante absolutely hated. So it wasn't just fan fiction. It was basically revenge fiction. Anyway... Dante's hell was divided into nine regions or circles. Each was set up to contain a specific type of sinner, and there were all sorts of fiendish creatures tending to hell, basically janitors and maintenance people and security guards. And in the eighth circle of hell, Malbolg, which means evil pockets, Dante and Virgil met a group of dangerous fiends called the Malabranche, which means bad horns. And that is why, in AD&D 1st Edition, the Horned Devils got a nickname, Malabranche. And that is how a pop culture supplement to the original canon of the Bible helped create the original canon for D&D and then suggested a solution to the problem of how to reconcile the original canon with the supplements that were built to save D&D from pop culture. A pretty damn cool circle and a hell of a story. By the way, many of the Malabranche in Inferno actually had names, and those names have appeared time and again in pop culture. For example, if you're a Final Fantasy fan over a certain age, you might recognize Barbaricia, or Curly Beard, Cagnazzo, Mean Dog, Rubicante, Scary Red Face, and Scarmiglione, Troublemaker. Of course, if you're in my generation, you might remember them as Valvalis, Cagnazzo, Rubicante, and Milan, because of translation problems and memory space limitations. But that's a story for another time, and I'm not entirely sure how Barbaricia became Valvalis. Whatever. This story has gone on a little long, but I don't want to leave without telling you how to use devils in your game. But I almost don't have to, because there's enough pop culture devil lore to fuel another 60 years of campaigns. Read your classics, people. If you can't find a copy of The Tragical History of Dr. Faustus, Faust, or Dr. Faustus, check out more modern retellings like The Devil and Daniel Webster, or the Futurama episode, The Devil's Hands Are Idle Playthings. They are all excellent portrayals of devils doing what devils do best, corrupting good people. See, GMs always screw up the corruption thing. You can't just offer people the chance to get what they want by doing evil. Most people won't jump at the chance. What you need 
is desperation and a good sales pitch. And maybe a little promise that the small amount of evil done is insignificant next to the good being served by the payoff. And if you can't figure out how to pull off a good corruption story, at least devils make interesting combatants. They have a hell of a lot of variety. This has been the GM Word of the Week. It was written by the Angry GM and recorded and produced by me, Fiddleback. You can find more at theangrygm.com and madadventurers.com. Thank you.